Okay. That was pretty glum, wasn't it? Um, and true story, Trump learned how to throw Ivanka under the bus through this episode. Um, so let's start. This is a very, I don't usually interview this many people. Um, and congratulations that Elon's buying your company. It's great. Um, I'm sure he's not gonna buy it and pay the price that you thought you negotiated. But let's start and we'll go down the, the, the row. I think you obviously know the cast, but we'll introduce them. Creator showrunner, Jesse Armstrong. Uh, executive producer, director, Mark Mylot. <laughs> Needs no introduction, Brian Cox, who plays Logan Roy. <laughs> uh, Sarah uh, Snook, who plays Siobhan Shiv Roy. <laughs> Kieran Calkin, who plays Roman Roy. Uh, Jay Smith Cameron, who plays Jerry Kelman. Uh, Nicholas Braun, who plays Greg, cousin Greg, Greg Hirsch. Uh, Jeremy Strong, who plays Kendall Roy. And I want to pronounce this right, Matthew McFa McFadian, um, who plays Tom, Trader Tom. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try to get questions for everything. Just so you know, Jeremy and Matthew have to leave early uh, because they have flights. So I think I'll just, uh, I'm sorry? Oh, you are? Okay, good to know. Oh, you're all just gonna leave. <laughs> I've got all night. <laughs> you gotta go to the toilet. Okay, great. Okay, oh, right. <laughs> okay, so let's start. Well, okay, all right, sounds good. Can someone take him? Because he's a little confused. Um, so let's start with Tom the traitor at the end, because um, you guys have to go. So I think one of the, the key parts of this that people don't get is what you did um, to sort of set this in motion, to create the last part of what you did. And I'd love to know what you think about that, of how, why, how and why you decided to betray your lovely wife, Shiv. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if the answer. I, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure how, how calculated it was on Tom's part. Really? Um, and I did think for a while it was a sort of a result of, you know, like a betrayal by a thousand cuts and humiliations and both things. But mm -hmm. actually, I was thinking about it today, and in, in story time, it's only been a year since the wedding night. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Shiv says to Tom, I'd really like an open marriage. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of, like, maybe it's just a couple of big sledgehammer blows over quite a short time. Mm -hmm. And he's just thought, I'm making a, you know, a practical decision. I'm sort of, and maybe it comes out of fear. Mm -hmm. I don't know is the answer. I don't know exactly why. Well, we'll get to Jesse. He can tell us why. But, um, but, but, Brian, I want to ask you: um, when you think about what you did, you know that you got this information from Tom, and you betrayed your children. Really, how did you? I didn't. You didn't. Tell me why. Not you, but your character. No, I didn't. He didn't. He didn't. Tell me why. Because they're pain in the ass, all three of them. Right. <laughs> They've got everything they deserve, you know. Right. I didn't betray anybody. I just, uh, you know, they, they're stupid. They're idiots. They, uh -huh. they behave in a very stupid, idiotic way, and they had what's coming to them. Uh-huh, uh-huh. The long and the short of it, and that's it. End okay. of story. All right. So, no, no, you think it was the right decision to do that, to get rid of the stupid of children? So it's the only decision. When you're dealing with these three, what else can you do? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, stupid children. Um, uh, why don't we start with you, Shiv? I mean, because, uh, and I'll, I'll end with um, uh, Kira, because you were with him, with him for a while, and then at the last minute, but, but turned with, with your siblings. So what do you each think of that? Actually, let's start with um, uh, Jeremy. When you were the one that sort of set it in motion, the idea that you were going to win this fight with your father. What do you mean? What? I mean, what, do you think you're stupid? Did it, was it stupid? When you were doing it, I thought this is precisely what he would do in terms of trying to beat him and win control of this company. I actually don't think that the character is in a particularly um, willful place mm -hmm. uh, at that point. I think um, ending up on the ground in the dirt in that parking lot sort of blowing too many pieces, I think 
that um, it is something that he says to these guys about how he just wanted to be near them. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, pass me the shotgun, but I don't think that's said with the same voltage and intention mm -hmm. as it might have been said in the first season. Right. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I don't feel that I'm the prime mover of this thing. It feels like I'm, I'm a, yeah. In the car, though, you were you were all very excited, especially you had a very, you know, this is going to be it. We've got it. And you call Tom and everything. Talk a little bit about your motivation, because you have been pushed aside several times during the, the this last season. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think um, Shiv, uh, you know, in, in this moment is very, um, well, she's quite good at compartmentalizing things. And I think, <laughs> you know, certainly during the parking lot scene. <laughs> Which was amazing. Yeah, and she's able to at least run two tracks during that of it's all very nice to be crying, brother, but we've got a company to save mm -hmm. still, you know, is boiling on the other side. And so I think in a lot of ways Shiv is being the the driver of that mm -hmm. sort of attack in, in a way um, and certainly feels that there is a... Um, you know, there's a, the collaboration, obviously, in the in the van and about um, how we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. But um, I think, you know, throughout the entire season, she's she's been building this um, energy to to face Dad, mm -hmm. uh, and in the final showdown, I guess, has that energy behind from from her brothers uh, coming in with her and the you know the being united for the first time ever, really, against Dad. And why do you imagine your character did that? Because you had the most advantage or most to lose, I guess. Yeah, that's what, that was <laughs> tough to wrap my head around, actually, because I, I think he has no idea if he's making the right call in that mm -hmm. moment. I think that moment in the car when he says, yeah, fuck it, and I think you, you, there's panic because I... It's like trying to think mm, what, like, listen to it logically, like it, everything she's saying makes sense. And it's also kind of exciting that we're doing something together and trying to like do something different. Dad might be leaving me out um, mm -hmm. of this. It does seem like that's what's happening. So I'm supposed to do that. Also, it seems like something dad would do. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should do that. Uh, it, I don't think there was ever a confident real moment where Rowan said, this is what, this I, is he what just goes with it because he feels safe with them and, and mm -hmm. this feels right. Mm -hmm. uh, and but, hadn't done that at all before the whole time. Mm -mm. Right. I mean, like, there was, there was the coup in the first season. Right. Roman can't even get himself to raise his hand. Right, Like, right. I, I think that's really who he is. He's terrified and also admires uh, his father. So I think, I don't know. I remember on the day when we were doing the scene and you came up to me and told me to come on board, I remember having the feeling of being like, oh, uh, yeah, I'm coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one of the things Cousin Greg does is grows in the ability to manipulate people over the course, in, in, especially in Italy around the women. Talk a little bit about that. That was... <laughs> suddenly everyone's not good enough for this loser, but go ahead. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Talk about his... I'm for the character from day one. I just better with women. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. We kind of get there eventually. So grateful for that. Good, good. I'm going to ask Jesse why there's so little sex among you all, or, or just bad sex, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, talk about the development of your character, although I do think you should be dating Tom, but go, go ahead. We are, in a way. Yeah, uh, yeah. We spend a lot of time together. Uh -huh. We spend a lot. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in life. No, um... What was the question? <laughs> Talk about the development of your character. But it's because it's, it's played for comedy in the beginning, right? It's, it's played for this, this sort of feckless extra relative who just says yes and shows up. Well, I guess he serves from like a structured point of view as like the fish on water, the audience perspective, the naive person entering the shark tank. Um, so you get to sort of contrast how fucked up these people are because they bounce off of this kid who just doesn't know anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think he, what I think we've wanted for him is to slowly grow maturity, but also like lose some of that naivete. And he's very fear-based, or maybe I played him that way, mm -hmm. but um, 
but I think it's been nice to chip away at that um, over the course of the show. And I think in the finale, what Tom offers him, which he doesn't even really fucking know what that is. Right. Um, but he's like dark side, like <laughs> Satan, devil stuff, like <laughs> get rid of my soul, like with you. And, you know, uh, I think he fucking signs up. And, right. and what I think's great about that and what I think it, like, um, <laughs> like brings a lot of relief to Greg is like, I don't have to be that scared anymore. Like right. I get to kind of go for it now. Mm-hmm. No matter what, you know, I, he probably tells me like an hour after the finale ends, like what we're actually doing. Yeah, cool. But and you'd be like, anyway, that's those are some thoughts. <laughs> okay. Um, so speaking of weird relationships, Uh-oh. yours. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk about that? Because two of the best scenes I thought were between you and Shiv, which was the most uncomfortable sexual harassment scene I've ever seen, um, and and you and Ronan about your relationships. So talk a little bit about your character, because you're always on the side of, ultimately, Logan Roy. Well, I'm always trying to uh, land on the safe side, which Mm -hmm. kind of shifts around in the story. Um, And I think that Jerry feels like he's the safest, soundest bet. Mm -hmm. But I I feel like, I don't know if Jesse agrees with me about this, but I feel like Roman has worked his way under her skin anyway, like, despite all her instincts. Like, Mm -hmm. she feels quite a lot of affection for him. But then the thing she was worried, so worried about the beginning, God damn it, if it doesn't come true mm-hmm. in the, at the final hour and screw everything up for me, or so it seems, you know? Mm-hmm. And then what, what else? Oh, did- when you, the, between you and Shiv, this relationship, which yeah. I thought was a fascinating. That was strange. interesting because something about the, the way, the order, and we were lucky about the way we shot it because. <laughs> it didn't feel like it at the time, but it was. Right. Well, I. <laughs> I mean, Jerry is sort of unflappable, but that mm-hmm. was the m- very flapped moment <laughs> right. for Jerry, you know, that d- to have that happen in the room, I don't really know what's going on. I can, I figure it out two seconds later mm-hmm. when he sends the picture meant for me and mm-hmm. it goes to Logan. Right. Um, and I think that I'm, my, uh, my head is spinning and my heart is beating and my blood pressure's gone up and then uh, right away I see what Shiv is trying to do and all I want to do is get to the ladies room and burst into tears which I've never done in front of any of them ever Mm -hmm. not even sure I could do it but that's it's like let me just walk with great assurance down the hall and get in the the stall and 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 put myself together Mm -hmm. and then she stops me at that very vulnerable moment and it was kind of nice because we had talked about a way to block it where we might perch on these seats Mm -hmm. and have this but I remember I just kept like awkwardly like angling my body away from the seats. Like, no, I'm mm-hmm. not really stopping. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to walk down towards that lady's room. Mm-hmm. And she kept kind of cleverly b- boxing me in. It was nicely awkward and nerve wracking. Mm-hmm. Because she thought she got you trapped in that regard. Yeah, but yeah, I... But physically, we weren't... Like, I, I guess in the way that uh, in my head I wanted to block it or have the scene go out... Physically, I would have been able to trap her more, but I wasn't able to yeah. physically. And I think that That's was right, really baby. that you did that on purpose, <laughs> probably, Mark. Um, <laughs> yeah, very much so. Um, but we also like had you know a very short amount of time to shoot the scene. I think we only had forty minutes from mm-hmm. an entire day, and then the last. 35, 40 minutes was like, quick, can you shoot this scene? It's a really long scene and a really important scene. Quick, 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 can you get it done? (laughs) Which definitely added to the energy of uh, though these women are both in in spaces unflappable in this particular space, these two actors feel very flapped Mm -hmm. and um, uncomfortable. And so that, you know, there's... I I like it when those those, uh, external environmental pressures can be put on to... Hopefully you have the confidence of the actor to turn to them rather mm-hmm. than get overwhelmed by them. But I think, so yeah. um, you're also the perpetual number two. I've met you a million times in people I cover, and they're always like you. Like, you know, they never get to the top. I was th- A lot of the time I was thinking Sheryl Sandberg for a minute. Never say time. never. Okay, all right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get to that. So... <laughs> I believe we are picked up for season four. So yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I, 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 apparently you're not going to tell me anything about it, but I'd like you to all to tell me what's happening. But, uh, Mark, talk about this episode, why it was important, and to sell, to, the switching of the sale to, to this Elon Musk-type character. I think the stakes are... Well, well first of all, I think I, I, I like to speak for Jesse at okay. every opportunity. But, um, uh, first of all, 
you know, it's obviously a reflection of, of, of real life to a certain extent, though, though not directly. And, and in this case, I think we needed a place for, for, for Logan to go, really, um, uh, uh, an, an existential threat to the company and, and to all those characters. I think, um, yeah, Jesse would explain it better than me in the writing. Um, for me, actually, what it represented was um, the ultimate division between between the family. I tend to be obsessed with the family dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, that That's kind of my contribution, I think, because despite myself, I find myself um, really incredibly attached to them, which is why I wanted to get involved in the first place, it was that these are the most despicable people, and yet mm -hmm. I'm absolutely fascinated by them, mm -hmm. um, the ultimate dysfunctional family. Um, and so I feel protective towards them, oddly, and that's, um, that's kind of my style of directing, is really to look out for every, every opportunity to protect the characters. Um, and in this case, there was nowhere for them to hide. And, and, and so ultimately this, the fact that In the baking that I, sun, the heat. Exactly. Uh, in the literal sense of, uh, of the Mediterranean sun, as with the, the end of season two. And there was... I couldn't protect the siblings. There was no way. They were, they were being absolutely mauled by, by, by Logan. And actually, I do agree with Brian. I don't blame his character. It was the perfectly right thing for it to do. So in that case, it's, the, it's almost a perfect dramatic premise to me. Um, so, yeah, as a director, to be put into that situation where I can't protect my kids in some level, um, it's a beautiful place to be, but a heartbreaking place also. Right. So, Jesse, where does it go from here? Because, you know, not the Murdochs, but they sold to Disney and then get to keep it. Not the Murdochs, maybe the people from Paramount who had a dysfunctional family. There's all kinds of business families like this. Where do they go from here now that they don't have power or, or, or they have money but no power? Well, yeah. I mean, it feels like a tempting piece of bait to right. go into season four, which I Please do. shouldn't do. Yes, why not? I shouldn't, no. A little I bit? <laughs> no, but I mean, you. I think... Elon's not buying Twitter, but go ahead. <laughs> Maybe well, this guy is won't. he or isn't he or is he or isn't he? You don't he think he, he definitely won't now? I don't know. <laughs> I do know, but I'm not telling <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we, he can. Yeah, you don't think he can? Yes, but let's, we're not talking about Elon Musk. Let's talk about your character about on the thing. The Musk thing is fascinating. If we're it's, not it, talking it, about it, Elon Musk, we're talking about Donald Trump. Let's talk about any of them, but go ahead. But this it, character is, is that it, guy. Uh, Elon is very um, liberating for the, the writing room because that, that stuff had started when we were finishing up the season four writing room. Mm -hmm. And every day the FT and Wall Street Journal give away these great, dynamics and storylines if you're willing to read about them and and Elon just made us feel like well anything that anything can happen in this next one and I won't talk about the business dynamics because they are a big engine of the show and 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 it'll be a it'll be a shame to spoil it mm -hmm. but talk to me about what why selling to an internet company this is what's happening in the larger sense is these internet companies are buying up whether yeah. it's Jeff Bezos at Washington Post or Lorraine yeah. Powell jobs uh, and at people Atlantic. people maybe like yourself thought that it would happen a little bit more, right? That yes. the, that Netflix would swallow Disney or yeah. is, and maybe it'll be the other way around now. But well, they're buying Roku. But go ahead. Uh, um, <laughs> so, it, it, what happened? What is on the cusp of happening at the end of this season in this show? hasn't quite happened, but things similar are happening in the world. And I guess, yeah, our show, uh, the show, although it's about very powerful and rich people, they're not the first order of media mm -hmm. owners right now, as social media is so much more profitable and has arguably greater reach, although obviously old media has agenda-setting powers. So uh, we wanted to get into that stuff. We felt it'd be, it would be untrue, it'd be yeah. interesting maybe to paint this family as the most powerful family in the world, but they're not. They're, they're you know, probably in the second division, the B, the B they League. They have become that. They, they have become that, that right, through the, through, the, uh, through the time that we've been making the show to some degree. Right. And so where do you then go from there if this is, he's given up that, that power? Well, I can't tell you. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing tomorrow? Uh, okay. Uh, so, so, Brian, one of the things, uh, move past the shitty children, um, but you were now, you looked freed at a moment. You were fighting with this internet mogul, but then you freed yourself. You decided this, now he's got me cornered, essentially, and decided to sell. Can you talk about that idea of someone who's... Who's talking about? Your character, Logan Roy. Um, no, the internet guy who bought your company. Who's that? Lucas Madsen. <laughs> Lucas Madsen. Skarsgård. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we 
Yeah, I, I like him. Yeah. <laughs> I thought he was really nice. Okay. And I thought he had more potential than these three and several other three put together. Right, okay. Uh, really, I thought that uh, there was a possibility because it seemed to me somebody who really knew what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. was very honest wasn't devious. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's devious, but like, we're all devious. Mm -hmm. And I, I really rather, I look forward to the fact that I'm going to be possibly in partnership with him. Mm -hmm. and I think you'll do the company a lot of good. Right. And to like these people who will destroy <laughs> the <them. laughs> You actually look hurt right now, just so you know. <laughs> yeah. So it helps that he's Swedish. Really? Why? Because Swedish people are very nice. Okay. Okay. Not all American people, but right. American people. Right. <laughs> I actually think that uh, I, I feel very confident that uh, he'll do a great job, and I think we'll have a very harmonious relationship. <laughs> I think we'll go on for bigger and better things. Okay. So. We're going to Norway or Sweden or wherever it is he lives. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the son you always wanted, essentially. Sorry? The son Logan Roy always wanted. Well, I don't know about that. Right, okay. <laughs> I mean, I really, you know, you, you get dealt a hand, you just have to deal with the hand. <laughs> right. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yes, I did. I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask Sarah. Do with what they are. All right, but, no, all right. Logan, so <laughs> but, but I want to ask, because I want to ask. Logan, look at the mother for <laughs> Stuck up English bitch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Now, um, so, <laughs> all right. I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to get to the stuck up English bitch in a second, but talk a little bit about that scene. I'd love each you and Jeremy to talk about that scene. Was devastating between you and him. Um, talking about your background and to suck it up, and you left him at that dinner table. How did you want to play that? Well, I just wanted to get dinner. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. You know, I wanted to have a nice dinner with my son, and yeah. perhaps we could iron out a few problems. But he's so paranoid, mm -hmm. and he immediately starts doing things with the dinner plate. Mm -hmm. And I think, what the fuck is he doing with the dinner plate? <laughs> right. And why is he doing that? Where is it? Oh, that's for him. And I'm going, well, what the fuck does that mean? That's right. by him. Mm -hmm. So I immediately I think to myself, oh, I see what he thinks. He wants me to think this food is poisoned. Mm -hmm. So, oh, he wants me, to, okay, so, uh, well, I'll get my grandson to test the food to see if it is poisoned. Yeah. I know perfectly well that the food isn't poisoned. Mm -hmm. But it's a very interesting kind of dynamic that goes through the scene. Right. And, uh, and it's... You know, down to these guys because they've written it rather well. Right. And uh, Jeremy, why don't you talk about that scene? Because it was painful to watch as you did that, as you thought he was trying to poison your son or you were trying to poison him. Well, I mean, I, I love that scene. And what, you know, I think all of us often feel when we open these scripts that we're reading, like, the best material we might ever get to work on. And that, that scene was certainly one of them. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. And, and then I think you just feel a tremendous responsibility to not fuck it up. Mm -hmm. And um, we'd had a long day that day already uh, shooting and, 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 um, and we just turned the cameras on and, and from start to finish just did the scene. I don't think we spoke to each other. We did the scene a bunch of times from, mm -hmm. from top to tail. And... Um, yeah, it's just an incredible scene. I don't, I don't know what to say. I mean, you know, as an actor, whatever you might be able to do is really entirely dependent on the person you're in the scene with. Mm -hmm. So when you get to be in a scene with Brian, a scene like that, it's, it's, it's as good as it gets. The scene between the three siblings is also intense. Yeah. The three ones. How did you think about playing that? You're on the ground. For some reason, I got obsessed with the dirt that was all over you. You know, the the clay dirt. I think it's clay. I guess. I, I you know, I didn't think about playing it. I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't think about how anything's going to come out. And 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 that day was a hard day actually. And and um, you know, I think. Um, 
we all came at it different ways and sometimes scenes don't catch fire the way you imagine they will mm -hmm. and I think it was like after 10 or 12 takes or something of doing the scene in a completely different way mm -hmm. uh, I, th I sort of just gave up because it, I, I wasn't serving the scene and it wasn't happening mm -hmm. um, and sat on the ground. And so that was just an accident. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was just a, a mistake. And then things sort of coalesced, I felt, w with all of us. Um, but That's interesting because I've, I've never actually talked to you about it. Um, it's interesting to hear that because I, I thought... Well, it was one of the hardest days of work, actually. That was that was the toughest in the entire series um, for me. And I want to tell a little story that I, I told about you. Because <laughs> uh, we were all having a really hard day. And I think it, it's interesting because I thought maybe you felt a little bit more comfortable with that scene or something. I thought maybe because, to me, I was I was having a really hard time. I, I started losing the sense of it. I didn't know what was going on at one point. I just wanted to just bail. I remember thinking, there there's going to be, I've never done this, but maybe I can just go home. <laughs> like, I'm just going to go. Um, serious. Like so, on a plane? And, like on a like, plane? Like, no, I'll go to, I'll show up again tomorrow when we're at a different location. Yeah. So we're, like, basically, I'm trying to figure out how to be done with the scene. Maybe they can write me out of it. Right. Uh, even though Why? we've already shot, like, four Why? hours. Why ago. is that? Because it was... It was, it's, it's really hard to explain, but it was, it just wasn't... Sometimes you have a really hard... Like elements against us as well. Yeah, it was hot. It was like... I mean, I'm Celsius, so uh, 100 Fahrenheit, like 35, <laughs> 37 hot. degrees Celsius, like mm -hmm. the sun, no, no sh clouds, just sun, and then the white dirt was also reflective, so sun up, really hot, just dusty, windy, everything that looks magical on screen is like an element that an actor nightmare. has to then work against, like rocks, incline, none of it is, is, is uh, useful for, for happiness, which right. is a good thing for uh, Jeremy in the scene because it's all against the what, you know, mm -hmm. uh, comfort. But then, like, I don't know, it was sometimes it, it, there's, like, a really hard day of work, but you at the end of it feel like, okay, I think we got something or whatever. This, I didn't have a sense of it at all, and you really look forward to that. And sometimes when I'm lost, I go, you know, you just look at the other person, we're finding it, you got, but I couldn't quite get that sense. She, she gets a pebble in her eyeball and we lose like an hour of shooting because they can't see out of this eye see. yeah i was half the scene and i looked i've searched through the takes because like there are a few takes where i had to be like this i was like i can't i've given up i'm yeah. sorry yeah. i'm like hiding trying to be there for jeremy but like ducking my hat yeah. so that you can't see my eye because i can't see out of it they're like putting drops in your eye and then still like we're doing the next take and she's just doing this to me and <laughs> tears are streaking down and i'm like I, I and i'm looking at her going like i know i know this isn't happening it's not working you know and then i did leave <laughs> I hid behind like a tree and I realized no one knows I'm here and I started hearing that they were looking for me and I was like I'm just gonna stay here there was like a pool under a tree and I was like they can't see me they were right there and they couldn't see me and then eventually after about 40 minutes I thought I'll, I'll, I'll make an appearance and I start going back towards that and PA Joe comes up to me and says Sarah really wants to see you uh -huh. so I brought into the holding area Sarah's lying down with holding an ice pack on her eyeball yeah. And she goes, hey, I just wanted to check on you, see if you're all right. <laughs> like, just an amazing person to work with that yeah. she's dying, can't see, she right. might go blind, and she's concerned about me because I disappeared for a while. Yeah. Well, so maybe really that awkwardness works work about Sorry. you. Go ahead. Yeah, worried about you. You're a um, very lovely person. I just, just to say, after that scene, um, Jesse, there, there was a passage from the wasteland uh, that 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 had to do with a handful of dust, mm -hmm. and and it was really sort of uh, amazing to read that after we had done the scene. Oh, and go on. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> I prepared a little. It's going to be a reading for the four quartets at this point. <laughs> okay. So, uh, what you're? Oh, you're leaving. Let me ask Tom one more. Your scene with your wife at the end was intense. Talk to me about that scene very quickly. I know you got to get going. Uh, which faster. Bit? Which one? Hang on. <laughs> when you were in the village square, when you were wandering around. Oh, oh that's very pretty. Yeah. yeah, it was Banyo Vignoni. Yeah. Um, 
just a brilliantly written scene, funny and sad. And just, I mean, you know, it's a gift. We, like it's Darren hard to keep saying. a straight face. Say again? It's hard to keep a straight face a lot of the time because yeah. we're talking about things that are so horrible yeah. with such casual sort of airs and yeah. walking around a really pretty town. Yeah. And then one of my favourite lines, I had to say something like that, that's like in five Olympics time or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does Tom become more attractive now because of doing this? Being more no. attractive? Well, yes. <laughs> I can't. I can't get any more attractive as Tom <laughs> wants me. All right. <laughs> On that note, these okay, guys have to go. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so. <laughs> Nicholas, uh, since you're on the end, we're going to pick you off next. Um, but, okay. Uh, um, where does your character go from here? Not, you don't have to reveal anything, but what do you think is developed? He's now sort of tasted Satan, I guess, or whatever, however you put it. Chasing Satan. You, you know what my nickname for Rupert Murdoch is? A Uncle Satan. Title. But go ahead. Go ahead. Well, you know, <laughs> I think... <laughs> I mean, you really don't know. I know some stuff, but in a, um, let's go, like, kind of philosophical. Okay. Um, I think he needs a home. It doesn't need to be between three or four homes. He needs to be chosen and selected, and he has been officially by Tom and thus Logan. And so I believe, well, I don't know how, you know, how much, I'm not going to... I'm pretty good at walking the line here, but, uh, <laughs> but I would say that, there, like I said, there, there, there's relief. And then I think he feels like he has to be good mm -hmm. a lot of the time mm -hmm. and he has to be liked and he has to mirror people and yeah. be the kind of shape shifter that'll keep him in the room. Mm -hmm. And I think or hope that some of that... Um, you know, it, that gets a bit depleted by by this, by, like, a strong new move. Mm -hmm. um, but that's up to that gentleman, really. I'm but I try, I try to, yeah. When I'm, Tom upended your be. desk, that was a fantastic scene, when he, like, threw it apart. What was, like, doing that scene? I wish he was here to talk about that. Uh, it was fantastic. <laughs> you know... When we read it in the table read, it was it was like, oh my god, we get to do this! Oh my god! And then so they set up the room, and um, it's basically all breakable and resettable. Right. So Matthew has free reign to do anything, go anywhere. Our camera men are extremely facile and flexible with whatever you want to do. So they're give, he has no rules really. Mm -hmm. So then you just I just get to watch Matthew. <laughs> like like a bull in a china shop, just destroy right. this room right. and be afraid of him. But underneath it, I'm like, fuck yeah, he's fucking killing it. Fuck yeah, <laughs> he's fucking awesome. <laughs> oh, God, he's so good. Uh, stay Greg, stay Greg, stay Greg, stay Greg. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to hear about your process. Stay Greg. You know there's places in New York you can do this. There's like... Where you can destroy things. Yeah, I've heard yeah. about that. I've heard yeah. about that. You but no, do it, was, that. It, it was really wonderful. I think he's excellent. I'm so grateful to get to work with him constantly. So, do you, do you you remain allies? You are his what number two or what? How do you look at that? In the show. In the show. I don't know about life. I, I don't actually care. Number, is he number one then? Or? Well, he might be now. Yeah. I, he's number one still. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm Tom's number two because right. Tom's number one is him. Right. Yeah. 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 Shiv is down, it's lower, I yeah. guess now. <laughs> She's two and a half. Two and a half. Okay, Jerry, where are you in this? You were sitting in that living room, which I think was a shock to all the kids. You just went along with it. Well, I mean, I think she's terrified what, you know, where she's going to land. Mm -hmm. And is hearing these rumors, and they're all, you know, comparing notes. And then she gets the tap from Carrie... Mm -hmm. And she's like, I think she's just like, thank God, mm -hmm. I have shelter here. And she's uh, understandably really furious and betrayed and maybe a bit heartbroken over Pee The love of her life, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that it's, and I, I, I remember the, 
the, it was so hot out mm -hmm. there in mm -hmm. Tuscany and out there in the wedding that when we got to shoot that scene inside the villa, it was cool and you had that horrible feeling of the sweat on the back of your neck drying and chilling you mm -hmm. and everyone was wearing these metallic jewel tones. It felt like being in a gallery of Medici portraits. Mm -hmm. Like everybody had this mannerist portrait look mm -hmm. and it was kind of scary and awesome. Mm -hmm. But I just remember feeling very safer in there, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> With the powerful people. With the powerful people. Right. And when you, when you walked in to do that, uh, what did you want to get through when you walked in and were shocked to see her and the whole thing was all a setup, essentially? Yeah, that, that's one, too, the, but the, different from the parking lot scene where I felt like it must be happening. I didn't... It was the first time in the show I felt like, I don't know what to do with my body. What do I do with my hands? Right. Uh, but I thought maybe that's good. Yeah. And I felt so unsure of myself and then had to just sort of give over to the... I don't, I don't know. I, I guess that's what it is. Did you uh, try to leave again? <laughs> didn't try to leave, no, because I, I, I still got the sense that we were definitely doing what we were supposed to. I just felt very uncomfortable in the right way, I guess. Right. And um, it was much more claustrophobic. Yeah. Mark, talk about this idea, because one of the things, when you're around a lot of rich people, and I cover a lot of very wealthy people, their, their worlds become smaller and smaller and smaller as they get richer, and they get more and more warped, I think, because they get more comfortable, they're wrapped in cashmere, but it's suffocating often, and their helms all look like a version of the Four Seasons, essentially. Um, how do you think about that? Because one of the things is they were, they're suffocated, and then there it's open, and then they're, they're in that other suffocating room again, These, whether it's ballrooms or whatever. Yeah, the, uh, a lot of the locations that we choose, we, we, we do have a kind of very specific policy to try not to fetishize the wealth. You know, the, the, mm -hmm. the, you'll notice if you were to ever look at the episodes that the characters rarely, if ever, acknowledge their surroundings in any positive way. Well, except but, for the PJs, but go ahead. Except for that, yeah. Um, with that particular, uh, that f kind of finale scene in, in the episode, that was, you know, carefully chosen. We'd looked at a lot more kind of impressive and beautiful rooms. That one felt like a mausoleum. It felt like a tomb. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there, you, I've, you walk in there and you feel this kind of sticky oppressiveness. And the, the door and that, in particular. Yeah, and that just felt right for the scene. So, mm -hmm. you know, Jesse and I talked about it a lot. There was, you know, he'd written it, I think, as a more kind of, uh, more kind of grander Italian palace feel. Mm -hmm. um, but we were both sold on it, really, because of that very oppressive feel. It felt like a, a space where Logan would be, that that would be his choice. It was efficiency and power um, and, and totally emotionally dead. Um, mm -hmm. So it just felt like a bold choice. I do remember very clearly when we first rehearsed the scene as, as much as we do rehearse and uh, Jesse coming up after the rehearsal and whispering that he was actually a little bit concerned that it looked like a cheap soap opera. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a high confidence moment. That was yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because it's just as you say, a lot of those spaces are kind of interchangeable, kind of airporty and beige, and that's true. And, and I think yeah. we, we talked about it, you know, we're obviously in Italy and there could have been a more um, Medici kind of intrigue, Machiavelli-toned mm -hmm. room. But when Mark showed me that, I was like, yeah, that's, that's where they would be, so let's go with that. But then when we were, you know, it's a long scene and, uh, yeah, the palette of colours is a little bit like... Uh, South American soap opera, mm -hmm. and, and 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 it's long, and you can lose faith in your own writing, and it's like, fuck, we're just in there for like fifteen pages, and it's a fish tank, and like, is it just gonna die? Because there's because it's because it's tough, and then it's fine. Yeah, and it's then the actors start fine. saying the words, and then it kind of <laughs> comes to life. <laughs> yeah, and um, I don't. Um, I'm not one for doing this, um, giving actors compliments things. Um, <laughs> but um, we did. We have this way of doing scenes uh, where we always do them from start to finish. There's barely we shoot on 35 mil, so you've got a thousand foot roll. So both the cameramen are just dying under the weight of these rolls. Um, but we always shoot the the scenes from start to finish, and and that was a doozy, as you. have just yeah. seen um and the amount of times they did that and i can't even tell you everyone here on the two that have gone the the level of commitment i had to sit him down and actually nag him like i was his dad to tell him not to have a bloody heart attack because every single scene even when he was off camera he would still give 100 percent every time because he just doesn't know how to kind of calibrate and just feed he just they're just yeah. all in it um, he seems he seems super shy here but go ahead <laughs> 
<laughs> so the sheer work ethic of them all in just trying to find that scene, it was, uh, I was petrified because obviously it, it was the finale of the season and, and like Jeremy said earlier, you read a scene like that and you just don't want to fuck it up. But um, And there was all those worries about, you know, does it look a bit bland in here and all that. But the first scene... Um, it was just extraordinary. Uh, just uh, you, just as soon as you see them bring it all to life, and the spontaneity that they bring to it, and the intelligence, um, all of that, and uh, I become the luckiest person in the world because I'm in the room and I get to see that happen. So I have two more questions. We just have just a few more minutes. Your scene with your mother was horrible. It was talk about it. it, it well, it was great in terms of that. Um, we all have versions of that discussion yeah. with our mothers. Um, Talk a little bit about that, because the English, what is it? What's the word you want to use? Old English? British bitch. OK, thank you. <laughs> what was that one like? Because there was a party going on behind. You could hear the noise behind it. And then you had this discussion, which you've had a million times with her in yeah. life, that the character would have had. Yeah, I mean, in an interesting way, actually kind of counter to what Jesse and Mark were just talking about with the scene looking to drab or soap opery, mm -hmm. the, um, the final scene, that one we struggled to get a run on because it was looking too beautiful mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's Cortona and it's Italy and everything looks gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And so they, you know, it's one in the morning and there's like lights being cast on the on the church behind to make it look more and more depressing. And so I, I don't know, like <laughs> the more you do it, the more you kind of... I mean, Harriet's a brilliant actress and a great mm -hmm. teammate in that sort of sense. And, and I felt like once I heard that you were trying to make it look less pretty, it kind of gives you the permission to not worry about it. Like you're not, not over-egging anything. There's not, there's all, it, all it needs is like just the cigarette ash in the, in the tray and that's kind of what the relationship is between the two mm -hmm. in a way. Um, you know, and I love that line of like, you're my onion. Is There's this kind of weird uh, truce between them about... They've hurt each other equally, mm -hmm. and and that's somehow okay because both are equally hurt. Like they've they've both won in a way. Yeah. Like yeah. But uh, yeah. No, I. It's, well, except you were a kid when she was talking. About I know, you. but she. You can. But there's like I think well, it's certainly what inspires um, Shiv to go and think that she wants to be a mom for right. all of a sudden to like. Yeah, so want she wants you. to be a parent herself. Yeah. Because she can win against in that in sort of that avenue. Like I can I can do a better job than she did. Here's another avenue I could win in, but um, but yeah, there, there is like those realization moments I think in in that scene. I, the one that I really liked was yeah, the the kid sort of thing, like you know, being thirteen and realizing actually what that does in that scene. It sets up for the final bit where where dad does you know the thing that he does is like oh, it never was about dad wanting us mm -hmm. when we were 13 or when they they broke up. It was actually about dad winning us in that mm -hmm. moment. We never were wanted anywhere. Yeah. We were not wanted with, or perhaps we were wanted with mum, but she didn't try hard enough and was able to be beaten by dad too easily and so mm -hmm. it doesn't, it had no effect. And so, yeah, I think it's a pretty, it's pretty devastating at the end to realise that actually neither parent wanted you, they just wanted to win. So, uh, uh, so Brian, can you talk about that idea of where you, you, I know you're saying that these are stupid kids, but there is a price when you do this to your own progeny, correct, or not? Or in the next season, you're on to the next thing. Yeah, yeah, there is. I, I was just wanted to say something about this scene that uh, uh -huh. Jesse and uh, Mark were talking about. The, the thing about that scene, it was, it was brilliantly played. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Every, everyone was waiting for that. Is that no, an it, Apple Watch? It was a brilliantly Who playable scene. Yeah. It was so brilliantly written and also equally brilliantly directed. And uh -huh. it's very interesting they had this panic. But it's like the kind of panic you have at a, a wedding or something where you think, do I get married or not? You know, mm -hmm. do I, or do I? And I okay. think there was that element of panic. Yeah. And the scene was flawless. Mm -hmm. It was... It wasn't. It was. It was great to play. We played it every time. It had a great rhythm to it, and it, it had play. endless changes and endless shifts in dynamic. Mm -hmm. And with the the the, the uh, Jerry and Carl in the background, yeah. and, and 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 Frank, I, I just thought it was one of it was an impeccably written scene and impeccably directed. Mm -hmm. And I really, I, I we could have played it in a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and it would have still worked. You know, we could have played it anywhere because the strength of the scene is in the relationship with the people. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you could, you could argue about the space and say it's this, that, and the next. But the scene was so perfectly written and just a joy to play, as it always is with this material. Mm -hmm. And you we, know, we the, shot it, it over two days with a weekend yeah. in between. Yeah, we did yeah. As well. That was a tough thing to do, to have that long... Intensity. Yeah. Yeah. But it was really fun to come back. To, I, thought, I mean, I don't know, but you had, you had to drive a lot of the scene, Brian, but it well, come fun to come back to on the Monday because it felt like, oh, we've rehearsed this already. Right. We get to now perform it. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. not in perform it, but you know, the, in the sort of the actory kind of way, but like we're doing a play and we just get to do another night's performance. Uh, and I think that's the strength of how we all work and what the strength of this man is, mm -hmm. is that he understands the, without being theatrical, the theatric nature of a scene. Mm -hmm. So he allows the scene to play through. And, and he shoots in such a way that he has as much variation in terms of the shooting as possible. Mm -hmm. But the actual line of the scene is always perfect, right. I think. Yeah. I, I don't, I, there hasn't been one single scene that I, I've thought, oh, that's a little, not one in four seasons. I mean, three, how many have we done now? Three, <laughs> three seasons. Right. You know, I, uh, you know it, it's, it's always been on the nail every bloody time. Uh-huh. So, no regrets, just moving forward like a star of fact. No. Uh, no, no, none at all. I mean, I, I will argue with the edit, but that's a different problem. <laughs> you know, like, I, 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 well, anyway. <laughs> I won't go into that. But, uh, no, it, it's just always been like that, you know, mm -hmm. and... It, you know, anything that gets in the way of acting, acting the scene, you always go, oh, that, you know, and so much of the time, you know, when you're doing other stuff, there's always that problem that you say, I just want to act the scene and I can't because it's not quite there. <laughs> That's never, ever, ever been the case, has it? <laughs> ever. Throughout this whole, I mean, and, and that's what's going to be hard because it's a, it's a hard act to follow. Mm -hmm. Succession is an extremely hard act to follow mm -hmm. because it's, it's a brilliant piece of work. Mm -hmm. And the writing team are second to none. Absolutely second to none. So uh, we, just have, uh, we just have time for one more question, so I'm gonna give it to you, Jesse. You, these are despicable people. You call them despicable, horrible, dysfunctional, this and that, but people can't look away. It's, you know, Sopranos. There's a lot of families like that. How, how do you imagine I don't want to say how they recover from this, but remaining despicable has a price for all of them. So talk a little bit about how you keep the interest in people that are just vile to each other. Yeah, I mean, they've, <clears throat> they do bad things in the world, they do bad things to each other, but they're not, they're not outside the bounds of morality, of, like, things you would know about in your extended family, right? Mm -hmm. they, they don't... What they, the things that, that they put into the world are poisonous, but mm -hmm. the, the poison that they have between them is not of a different order from most humans. It's pretty imaginable in the writing mm -hmm. room, uh, and I'll pass on the nice words about the team, and it's a you know, big team, and we talk a lot about families, and this is, it's the, the stuff of this family is not alien to families. It's the very stuff of families, mm -hmm. right? Right. So? So, we find, so they're fascinating, and, they're, and, they're, and they're, it's not like they're plumbing some devilish depths of depravity that have never been known to humanity. They're pretty right. normal. It's their level of power and influence that is abnormal. Right. So are we going to depravity next? We're not, we're not, well, we're, I, no, I'm not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, on that. Um, thank you so much. It's a terrific season, this last one.